center of mass is absolutely crucial because again, when you hit the ground, by Newtonian mechanics, the ground hits you back with an equal and opposite force, and it's always directed here, and that's a crucial point here. So control and manipulation of the center mass is crucial to how we rehabilitate and increase performance in athletes. The center of mass is relative. It's, it's a, another name for the center of gravity. What is gravity? Well, it's 9.8 meters per second acceleration of force on your body and pushing you back into the ground. And so this is really important in balance, in sport, in functional activity, and it's also in falls. There's a whole group here at Mayo that just studies falls and the elderly and how important gravity and its effect on the center of mass are to long-term health outcomes. So definition, the point around which the mass of the body is equally distributed is the center mass. So the amount of mass, the location of the ma mass, added external mass, if you add, for instance, a bat, if anyone's going to the Twins game later this afternoon or tomorrow, it, it's, it, that's gonna change the center mass when you put a bat in someone's hand, for example. So it obviously has crucial relationships to balance, base of support, height of support, amount of mass, and inertia. So let's just quickly go through Newton's third laws as a primer. The first law, momentum, an object at rest will remain at rest unless acted on by a force. Force is required to change the state of that object's motions. Objects in motion <laughs> tend to remain in motion, objects, and then a force is required to stop that motion. So momentum is a crucial aspect to what we're going to talk to you about today. Your body has momentum, your body segments have inertia and momentum. The quantity of motion that something possesses, momentum is mass times velocity. So the human body possesses momentum when it is in motion, Exam for example, landing from a jump. So we're going to do our drop jump vertical test today and we're going to look and see how momentum affects those values. Transfer of momentum. Actually, momentum from the body can be transferred to an object like a baseball pitch. And alterations of that momentum will change the velocity of that pitch. So a, a momentum can also be transferred from one body segment to another. And we're going to talk about how that's important in sports of all kind. Angular momentum, again, the body as we move, we have momentum in linear plane. My center of mass has a certain momentum moving forward but it also affects the rotation. My joints are rotating, and each of those segments of my body has momentum and inertia. So angular dep uh, momentum depends on mass, angular velocity, and the moment of inertia about a rotational axis. So for angular momentum to remain constant, you, you have to uh, either increase or decrease as inertia changes. Let's go Newton's second law. Newton's second law is crucial because what it tells us is when force is applied to an object, the acceleration that the object experiences is proportional to that force and inversely proportional to the mass. So important points. Large forces, you need to move that line, and large forces are needed to produce high rates of acceleration in objects that require large substantial forces to cause them to move. This is crucial, and you're going to hear about the third law. It's the one I've been talking about of equal and opposite reaction. Basically what it tells us is that for every, ops, every force there is an equal and opposite force that has to be counteracted. So for example, when I'm, I'm walking and I hit the ground and the ground hits me back, now as my knee progresses angularly into more flexion, what happens is the ground reaction force reacting to my center of mass comes behind the knee joint and what it's doing is tending to crumple my knee joint. It's trying to collapse it. What I'm doing internally is creating, an, that, so that's an external flexion moment or torque about the knee joint. I have to create an internal torque to counteract that so I don't collapse down. So that's crucial and, and this is the crucial law that biomechanics and especially kinetics is based off of. So for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, motion and, mo and force. So this is crucial to everything we do in sports and sports medicine. Any movement by the body that is free to uh, result in the counter movement it means it's impossible, for example, to initiate rotation when you have nothing to push again, like in the air. So for a gymnast or a figure skater, this is crucial. You have to create that, that momentum to begin with. 
So what I'm going to get into just very quickly is some of our approaches, and one of these approaches we call preventive biomechanics, where we actually use biomechanics to assess injury risk and to ameliorate or reduce that injury risk. And what we do, importantly, is all of our staffing, and I think this was important, what Mr. Wright was pointing out earlier, we're totally integrated in, with the, in interacting with the sports teams on a regular basis. So our researchers, our clinicians, our orthopedic surgeons, our physical therapists, our athletic trainers, our strength coaches, everyone is involved together with the treatment of that athlete, the preparation, the prevention, which we're gonna discuss a lot, but we're also gonna talk about rehabilitation, especially tomorrow. So we're gonna focus on primary prevention, prevention of the first injury today, though we're gonna do some lead into that today, and then tomorrow is almost gonna be exclusively on rehabilitation and then prevention of second injuries, which are a big problem. Does anyone know what the best predictor of any injury is? Is first injury, prior injury. And so we're gonna talk a lot about that both today and tomorrow. And we're gonna talk, basically what we do is we take a three-pronged evidence approach. We look at mechanisms and evidence supporting those mechanisms of injuries, and then we do take that information from the mechanisms and we do screening and risk stratification of athletes, and then based off that both of those pieces of information, both mechanisms and the risk stratification, we develop targeted intervention programs to help reduce the risk of those injuries. ACL injuries, everyone's seen these and we're gonna show you some gruesome videos today, so be, be prepared. I'm gonna give you in a very quick nutshell here if you look at, and, and I challenge anyone to bring me a video of anyone tearing the ACL that doesn't have these components. What you see is a body hitting the ground, and what happens is you have this lower extremity, what we call valgus. Now valgus is kind of a dirty term. Basically, it's, it's more of a clinical term. It's definitely not a biomechanical term, but what it means is this combination of rotations and luxations where the, the core is usually somehow perturbed, and then the hip drops in, you get adduction of the hip, it drops in toward the midline. Abduction, now I know some clinicians don't get, what do you mean by knee abduction? Because abduction means away from the midline of the body. What's abducting is the distal tibia. So the knee's dropping in, the distal tibia is falling away. That's what we mean by valgus. And what these are a couple, in, in addition to that, you're getting internal hip rotation. So valgus is kind of this dirty combinational term, but that's what you see during these injuries. And then what happens is the, it starts out with the knee in relatively low flexion. It happens with most or not, or if not all the weight on a single leg. And then the center of mass tends to be a, a displaced away from the foot base. So then if we zero in on the knee joint, what you see is this. You get this combination of basically three coupled rotations that, that are related directly to the body habitus, that body kinematic. So if this is my fibula, this is my tibia, what you get is tis, distal tibia abduction. So you're getting adduction of the femur and the hip combined with anterior translation of the lateral tibial plateau and internal rotation of the tibia applied rapidly with that ground reaction force, pop, you rupture that ligament. That is how you tear an ACL. Dr. Shalati and Dr. Bates are gonna show you a lot of evidence for that today. I've got a whole nother lecture on that, but they're gonna provide that later and do a much better job than I do. So this is uh, Michael Owen tearing his ACL. See the combinations of those rotations that I just talked about? You see this in nearly every single video of someone tearing their ACL. So as he's hitting the ground, because of two reasons, his knee's relatively straight and his foot's relatively flat. ACLs happen almost always on a flat foot. Because of that, what does that mean? It means high ground reaction force. Torques applied very rapidly to the joint Jolt, we term that, and our MD, PhD student, Joe, can tell you much more about this. He published a paper. Jolt is the acceleration of the acceleration of that load on the joint. 
So very rapidly and very often you'll see actually a, a backward, it's happening so quickly you'll see a valgus varus valgus almost shaking of the joint because it's applied so rapidly. It's causing vibration in the joint. And because it, the force is high and because he allows his trunk, which the force is tracking his center mass, he allows his trunk to come laterally, the ground reaction force is high, it goes lateral to the center of rotation of the joint you have a high force, a high distance, you have a high torque, and because his foot's flat and he's not flexed, his musculature is not absorbing that force with high efficiency. High force applied very rapidly, rotating off a high distance, high torque, high jolt, tears the ACL. Those combinations of rotations are what do it. We're gonna talk somewhat about female athletes today. We, we, this is home to the three-time world champion Lynx. Everyone in the NBA and WNBA faces the problem of ACLs. It's a scary perspective. Since the lockout two and a half years ago in the NBA, 15 starting point guards in the NBA have torn their ACL. Do you know what, how big of a problem that is for the NBA? in excess of $300 million in the last two and a half years. Lost to play. Females are at higher risk. Now in our populations, in the US currently, the, the, the differential in absolute numbers is only about 60-40. It, it depends on what population you're looking at. In, in the populations we look at, where we have a lot of young female soccer and basketball players, it's about 60-40 in the absolute numbers. However, if you normalize that per total exposure to sport, it's in soccer, it's somewhere between say three and four times higher risk in females than males. In basketball, it pushes much higher, somewhere between four and 10 times. There's a study out of Canada by Gray et al said 10 times higher exposure. But it's somewhere in that range of say four to six on average. So again, it's so important if we're gonna look at mechanisms and we're going to look at screening athletes at risk and we're going to reduce relative risk, we have to get at this mechanism of how it's occurring, occurring in the body, but also how it's occurring at the knee joint. And then what we've done over the last 25 years is develop this paradigm where we said, what accounts for this? What are the underlying neuromuscular control mechanisms that relate to these four aspects of the injury mechanism? Importantly, these are modifiable. We can adapt them. We can change that in the athlete, which is crucial. And there are other, there are other inputs. For example, in the female athlete, estrogen may be involved in, say, in some individuals on loosening up that knee joint. But the crucial part is we can actually modify these, you can actually modify these in a systematic, reproducible, reliable way. So this knee abduction part of the mechanism relates to what we call term ligament dominance. And what I mean by that is instead of muscle dominant movement patterns where you activate, especially posterior chain muscular, sure, crucial is the glute and the hammy, to pull the tibia back relative to the femur and decrease those rotational moments. If you're ligament dominant, you let the force go to the joint and to the ligament. And ligaments are not designed to absorb force, muscles are. And then if you look at the low flexion part of the mechanism, what you'll see is individuals that are higher risk are quadriceps dominant. What they do is they, they activate the big quad muscle at the front to try to stiffen the joint. Well, that does stiffen the joint, but there are problems due to the congruency because what, what happens is your, your lateral tibial plateau, and, and uh, Dr. Schlady and Bates will show you this, they're, they're basically both convex surfaces. So they move one another relatively rapidly, whereas, whereas the, the medial side, what you have is a convex surface and the tibial plateau is more concave. So it fits in better. So what you get is rotation. Now if you push those two, or you pull them both together using the quad, what do you get? You get that. So being quad dominant is not, is not uh, the best strategy. In addition, the quad inserts at the front of the tibial eminence and pulls the, the, ACL, the uh, tibia forward. What the ACL is doing, so this is your ACL, proportional to the size of your pinky, it's, it's a couple centimeters and a half. It's the first two digits there. And basically what it does is it prevents the knee from coming apart. One way is to from, it resists that anterior, this motion 
of the tibia. And we'll talk about how, what it resists in all three planes. So quadriceps dominance is not a good strategy for reducing strain on an ACL and preventing injury. What we have to do is develop posterior chain dominance, which is doable reproducibly. And then this single leg part of the mechanism relates to leg dominance. All athletes are leg dominant. We have favorite plant legs, favorite kick legs, favorite takeoff legs. But in those athletes that are susceptible to ACL injury, they tend to be more asymmetrical, especially relative to their ham quad activation side to side. They might be more quad dominant one side and more ham dominant on the other. And that those asymmetries are always good predictors of future risk, both first and second, and what Dr. Webster is going to talk even tertiary, even third and fourth ACL tears. And then the foot away from the center of mass, obviously dynamic uh, addressing this, this neuromuscular lack of control. We, we published about 15 years ago, what we said is the trunk was too upright. And then there was a, a group down south that said, no, the trunk is too flexed. What we figured out from that data is it means the trunk's flopping around too much. It's more out of control. So what we have to be able to do is control and stabilize and make that, that trunk more stable. And, and we'll talk more about that. So I'm going to give you the punchline here, and then I'm going to move on to Dr. Webster. This is the, the punchline of everything we're going to show you later this afternoon. In order to address those four aspects of the injury mechanism, those four neuromuscular imbalances that feed into that injury mechanism, what we have to do is address knee abduction, this problem, with biomechanics and technique. The low flexion aspect, we're going to use ham quad, especially posterior chain up, power that up, power the posterior chain up, increase that glute and hamstring uh, recruitment, calf musculature recruitment. And then single leg part of the mechanism, we're going to do a lot of dynamic single leg foot based balancing drills, hopping drills, plyometrics that are going to translate out onto the field and onto the court. And the same with the core. We're going to do a lot of core stability training. Now we may start with the feet off the ground, we may, we may work very proximally, but then we're going to progress that to distally, then we're going to put that individual on the ground. So again, what we do with that individual is translated onto the field and onto the court.